Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Doug Heim, the Town Council of Arlington. This meeting of the Police Civilian Advisory uh, Review Board and Study Committee is being convened remotely, consistent with the state law regarding um, uh, allowing participation and con conduct of remote meetings during the COVID pandemic. Um, a few quick notes for this meeting. The meeting is being recorded. Uh, the meeting is also going to be conducted in a fashion that we're going to ask everybody to try to clearly identify themselves um, when they're speaking. So please either make sure that you've got a fully uh, written out screen name, don't use a nickname, so the record can accurately reflect who's speaking. Uh, Mr. Newton is, I believe, taking minutes this evening. Um, all votes are gonna be conducted by roll call. Uh, I believe we've got a busy agenda. So with that, I'm just gonna take a quick roll call of members. And if I leave anybody out, um, uh, just give me a quick, quick wave. So. Um, uh, Mr. Newton? Here. Mr. Morales? Here. Mr. Brownstein? Here. Ms. Oh. Gittleson? Here. Uh, Jillian Harvey? Here. Kathy Rogers? Yes, here. Karen Bishop? Here. Susan Ryan Vollmer? Here. Chief Julie Flaherty? Here. Bob Radosha? I see Bob. Bob, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. And I think that's it for uh, members. Oh, I see uh, Ann Brown is joining us now. Uh, and I believe that we're also uh, joined by Chief Michael Wynn, but I'll leave those uh, introductions for, for the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, and thank you for Double tap, double being at two meetings tonight. Um, I am. Re I'm going to turn it over to Susan uh, to introduce Chief Wynn, since she's the one who has been in contact with him, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. You're, you're still muted, Susan. <laughs> what? We're two years into the pandemic. You'd think. Um, we'd have the Zoom etiquette down. Um, so Chief Michael Wynn, he's been Chief of Police of the Pittsfield Police Department since 2007. He's one of Governor Charlie Baker's three appointees to the Massachusetts Peace Officer Standards in Training Commission, known as the Post Commission, which we've been talking about um, in a lot of our meetings. The Post Commission has nine members, um, and it is charged with creating a mandatory certification process for police officers as well as processes for decertification, suspension of certification, or reprimand in the event of certain misconduct. And Chief Wynn is well suited for this work. Last year, he was appointed to the National Leadership Council of Fight Crime Investing Kids. This is a nonprofit that promotes bipartisan solutions to reduce crime and help children succeed. He's served as a subject matter expert and drill instructor at multiple police academies including as an adjunct instructor for the Justice System Training and Research Institute at Roger Williams University since 2006. He's been an instructor for the Municipal Police Training Committee in Randolph since 2001. He's been an adjunct professor at Mass College of Liberal Arts since 2018. From 2001 until 2007, Chief Wynn served as a staff instructor for the Municipal Police Training Committee in Springfield. And in 2003 and four, he served as a leadership fellow with the Drug Enforcement Administration's Leadership Development Unit, where he earned certification as a DEA, DEA tactical instructor. Prior to his appointment as chief of police in Pittsfield, Chief Wynn served as a patrol officer, shift supervisor, shift commander, and administrative captain of the Pittsfield Police Department. He holds a bachelor's degree from Williams College and a master's in criminal justice from Anna Maria College. I'll just turn it over to Chief Wynn. We're very grateful that you're here with us tonight. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Okay. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with you. Um, the purpose of my visit has evolved a little bit since I was first contacted. If I understand correctly, um, your primary charge is to do some research around civilian oversight or citizen review boards. Uh, and then in the most recent email, Susan indicated that you might also have some questions about um, the post commission and the uh, Massachusetts police reform legislation. So I'll do my best to um, 
to at least give you my experiences and my insights with this. Uh, I do have to, you know, start off with the disclaimer. I'm not an attorney, so I can't give you anything that might resemble legal advice. I can share with you the legal advice that was given to me by our attorneys and by uh, counsel for other factions during some of this discussion. Um, but I, you know, I think what I'll, with your permission, what I'll do is I'll just do a real quick summary of kind of how we got where we are in the city of Pittsfield um, and kind of the status quo and then take your questions. So uh, as Susan said, I've been with the Pittsfield Police Department for, uh, you know, with a couple um, collateral assignments elsewhere for my entire career in some capacity for almost 28 years. I started with the department as a civilian in 1993, right after I got out of college. I went to the academy in 95 and started patrolling in 96. I've had a variety of assignments, um, but my time with the police department between 93 and 95 was, was a, as a program manager, grant programs manager, um, handling the community policing grants that the department was receiving at the time. So my background pre-law enforcement was in community policing. Um, and when I got out of the academy and got on the job, um, for obvious reasons, that, that kind of continued. So at that time, let's say 1996 through, well, in all honesty, September 11th, 2001, um, I was heavily invested, involved in the department's community policing. And we had predecessor of our current um, police advisory review board as kind of like a advisory committee to the chief of police. It was kind of like a kitchen cabinet. It was a collection of resident volunteers who were involved in our community policing programs. And at any given time, um, you know, the chief could schedule an impromptu meeting. They weren't, it wasn't a acknowledged formal body. So they weren't public meetings, they were posted meetings, they were informational. And uh, my predecessor, Chief Riello, he would meet with them, you know, quarterly or six times a year. And because I was involved in community policing activities, not every meeting, but frequently I would attend those meetings. It was kind of more uh, informal exchange of information. They would tell us what was going on in their neighborhood watches or, uh, or with the staff at some of our substations. And we would share with them things that we had on our plan for new initiatives and um, new plans. After September 11, 2001, when a lot of the federal grants for community policing dried up and were reallocated over to Homeland Security, those meetings kind of fell off. and. Um, as a result of those meetings falling off and some decisions that were made by the administration at the time, a lot of our community policing programs also evaporated. Um, the substations that we had been using community policing money for to lease, um, we, were, we were directed to give up those leases and close them down. Uh, and so we, we lost quite a bit of um, collateral and, and good faith with the community as a result of the loss of some of those funds. And that informal group didn't meet anymore. That situation kind of uh, stayed the same until December of 2007. Uh, actually, a little bit later that I took command of the department in December of 2007. We had no civilian advisory group at that time. Um, I went through some executive development beginning in 2008. And during that executive development, a colleague of mine who had a lot more experience uh, as a department commander shared with me that he also had an informal advisory group that he worked with um, on a regular basis in his community in Maryland. So in late 2008, I started floating the idea with my boss at the time uh, about this possibility or this prospect of putting together some type of informal advisory committee and it was not well received um it they basically they basically told me you know we get our input from this office and the city council and it's unnecessary and it's just going to open you up to exposure and so um that that idea kind of died on the vine it stayed that way until um god i'm losing track now it stayed that way for maybe three or four years. And we had had a um, change in administration. Uh, at that time, I had gone through the ordinances and found that there was an existing, recognized by code, advisory group that um, 
existed to advise the chief of police and the mayor. It didn't have any appointed members and it hadn't for a long time. And so I reviewed the ordinance and there was, the ordinance was very dated uh, and there was some issues that I, I had some concerns with. So working with our city solicitor, I rewrote the ordinance um, and got it passed with full faith and, and, and belief that the administration was going to appoint the members to this advisory group and that I was going to be able to work with them. We had an election. We had a uh, change of administration. The outgoing mayor departed without appointing anybody to the advisory group. And uh, the incoming mayor came in. And um, one of the first asks I made was, can I can I revisit the advisory group? And he didn't really give me a yay or nay. And a couple months later, I found out that he had appointed um, nine people to this advisory group without any discussion with me. And uh, they hadn't been vetted. Um, one of them, we were actively pursuing felony charges against at the time. Um, so, and go to the mayor's office and say, this isn't gonna work. You, you, gotta, you gotta work with me here. Um, and so, that iteration essentially died. So fast forward to, um, where are we now? It's 2021 now. So this would have been 2014, 2015. And um, we had a couple incidents that my department was involved in. They were not high profile incidents. Um, to be honest, they, they, they didn't even have to do with criminal cases. They both in some way or another had to do with dealing with individuals who, with mental illness and the execution of warrants of apprehension or section 12s. And um, one of them went off with, with no issue and the other one caused a, a little bit of contention. But following those two incidents, a small group um, of residents, one uh, party that was involved in that second incident, and then that party contacted the individual from the first incident and they really started lobbying and advocating um, for the creation of some type of, in their in their terms, uh, civilian oversight board or civilian oversight group. And so it became a very public and very contentious um, period of time. And you know, some members of the administration were like, "To heck with it! They can't do it without us. We'll just tell them no." Some members of the administration were like, "There's an opportunity here. We can kind of set the example." It got very divisive with the council at the time, and then it got really, really messy. And one of the reasons it got messy was that the the most vocal proponents, the people who were, you know, out there really making the case for some type of civilian oversight or some type of civilian review. They were doing a lot of research, but they weren't doing legal research. And so they were pulling examples of what was out there um, from all over the country. And, and some of them were from states that their constitutions were completely at odds with ours. Um, some of them were from departments that you know were 200 times the size of ours with paid professional investigators. Um, and so there, there was a lot of back and forth. We would receive the stuff and we would redline it and send it back and say, this is not going to work here. You know, we're trying to work with you. But they really wanted like strict civilian oversight, subpoena power, you know, authority to discipline. Um, ultimately, it got to during this back and forth, it got to the point where they got the code, the ordinance from Cambridge, uh, and they presented that to our legal department. And that caused that raised some eyebrows and caused some questions because there was some stuff in that uh, in that ordinance that, based on our um, our legal review, couldn't stand. It, it just it it didn't seem tenable. So ultimately, at that point, I reached out for Cambridge, and I was eventually put in touch with a gentleman named Brian Core. Um, Brian is the immediate past president of the National Association of Civilian Oversight for Law Enforcement. He's also a um, full-time employee of Cambridge. He works in their human rights um, in their human rights office, but he is the municipally appointed representative to their civilian oversight. Um, so Brian and I had a very healthy conversation, and Brian explained to me that the the stat or the ordinance was the ordinance, but the procedures that were in place in Cambridge. Do, did not actually follow the ordinance because some of the inf information or the items in the ordinance were in fact not 
legally tenable in the Commonwealth. So for example, and I don't know if this has changed since then, but at the time when we were looking at it, that ordinance granted that body subpoena power. And that is not a power that can be granted to a non-governmental um, quasi-judicial entity. It's it's just not, it's not one of the things a municipality can just create. Uh, there's There's gotta be a, a legislative process to do that. So, um, although it was in the ordinance, it wasn't in fact what they were doing. The other thing that Brian pointed out to me was that he was in a very unique position because he was employed by the municipality and essentially his job gave him um, basically the, the, the rights and authority of a member of the, the HR department, of the human resources department. And so he could look at and access items that the other members of their board couldn't because it was in his official capacity. And so he essentially was serving as a gatekeeper or a conduit. So he could interact with the police department, reach some agreement or consensus, and then take material back to their group. Once we kind of had an understanding of what Cambridge was actually doing, that gave us the ability to sit down and kind of recraft the ordinance over um, what eventually would become the Pittsfield Police Advisory Review Board, which is the entity that I've been working with for the last couple of years, several years. Um, our police advisory review board is 11 members appointed by the mayor um, at my request. Um, I don't have the statute or the ordinance in front of me. I think four or five of the members are at large. They're, they essentially don't represent a constituency. The remaining members are specifically selected. Uh, they represent members of the NAACP, um, our faith community, um, a couple other uh couple other nonprofit affinity groups and there's a student uh, youth representative uh, and so we we specifically identified some segments of the population that we wanted to make sure were represented um, they they do not because they cannot have subpoena power and they they do not technically um, provide oversight they serve in an advisory capacity to me the mayor and the city council um, they have the by by ordinance they have the stat the authority to review finalized closed disciplinary investigation investigative cases and to make recommendations back to me if they disagree with the disposition and actually i should i should rephrase that they didn't um they have the authority to make recommendations back to me if they disagree with the investigative findings or the discipline. Uh, I'm not obligated to to abide by their recommendations, but historically, I generally have. Um, as of January 1st of this year, they are they are actually entitled to review not just the final reports, but under um, legislative reform, they're also uh, authorized to see the discipline, the the actual details of the discipline. Um, in addition to that role, they also advise me on policy development. This part was a little dicey. I was sending them things kind of like for their stamp of approval. We had to get a legal finding that the statute didn't allow for that. They essentially, um, they, they participate in the draft process with my command staff and send me requests and recommendations. And then when we get to the final version, I, I again, issue that. Um, and they they do make recommendations to uh, both the mayor and the council. So um, they've done things like uh, our station is antiquated. So um, they've you know done station tours and they've you know written letters saying you know this is the situation in the police station. You need to explore looking for alternatives for a new station. Um, they made recommendations for training. Uh, they do have a fair what I would say for volunteers is a fairly stringent. A training requirement for membership. There's about seven policies and or lesson plans that they're required to kind of get up to speed on in their first several months as members. Um, and then pre-COVID, we're kind of getting back to that. We also um, expect them to schedule ride-alongs with our officers quarterly. Uh, so that once they get through the initial training, they schedule those with our shift commanders at their own convenience. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, 
That's a lot. <laughs> Should we open it up for questions? I'm seeing lots sure. of head nodding. So if folks have questions, just raise your hand. I did that good a job, no questions. Oh no, get, this is the calm before the storm. <laughs> Go ahead, Sanjay. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, could, could you talk a little bit about like how you felt that relationship has gone and, and you know, um, what things have made that relationship work or, or not work? Sure. Um, so, you know, that's kind of why I gave you the historical perspective. Remember that I initiated this conversation because I was looking for another source of information. Um, you know, we all we all have blinders when it comes to some things. So I was trying to make sure that we had an objective outside look at some of our procedures and some of our operations. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in love with the process that got us to where we are, largely because you know the the people who pushed for this particular thing they. It, they they were just demeaning us left and right. You know, they were coming at it like they just wanted to tear the department down. We were looking for a partnership. Um, once the, and I, I should say that, you know, the, the current police advisory review board is in a significant period of transition right now. All of their initial terms are coming to an end and some of them are not reelecting to continue to serve. Uh, we had a couple re resignations during the pandemic and their vacancies haven't been filled. So it's, um, it's a very chaotic time right now. Um, for the most part, I've I've been very very pleased with the relationship we've had with our incumbent members. Um, they they've been more than fair, um, but they've also asked hard questions. And I'm not not going to get into a ton of detail and bore you with the detail. But for example, you know I'm a I'm a police officer. You know. 28 years as a cop, I'm an investigator. Um, when I was delivering endorsements or findings on an internal affairs report, is very clinical and, and very austere, you know, concur, disagree, you know, this is not consistent. And then like, you know, chief, this is kind of harsh. Do you think you can soften the tone a little bit? And I was like, well, I could, but that letter's written to the cop. And so, like, well, maybe, you know, you should, you should have two versions, right? One for the cop and one for the complainant. It's like, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's good advice, right? Because our internal documents are written for an internal audience, but because of the internal affairs open records, they're being read by an external audience. So we had to be mindful of that. Um, just a couple, you know, the, the language that we use in, um, in some of the reports, the language that we use. And in, in, so, you know, several years ago, just down the advice of a friend and a colleague of mine, I stopped, I, I deliberately stopped using the word citizen to refer to, you know, members of our community. And I switched to residents or visitors, but the complaint form was still called the citizen's complaint form. And, you know, is, I'm, I'm oblivious to it. I wrote that complaint form as a lieutenant in 2006. And so even that we had a conversation, I was like, I don't use that language anymore. They're like, it's on the form. <laughs> it's like, okay. So, you know, we, we had to edit the form. Carlos. Uh, hi, Chief, thank you for, for being here tonight and for sharing your thoughts in, in um, one one question that I have is so what do you think it's is your the greatest benefit the greatest advantage that you have by having this commission you know being uh, in Pigsville and that's one question and then uh, a second question would be um, uh, is there do you see that you know do you have any if, any problem in implementing this with uh, uh, collective bargaining so maybe let's start you know with the, with the positive side like what what is the greatest advantage of, of you see from this commission so for me the greatest advantage was having another um channel and mechanism of of public accountability and transparency so a lot of police officers in the commonwealth are surprised to find out that internal affairs records are public 
they've been public for a long, long time. Um, but the interesting part about the decision that made them public, it's, you know, the Worcester Telegraph decision is it's not proactive. Like I don't, I don't conclude an internal affairs investigation and publicize the results. It, under, the, under the case law, it's entirely incumbent on the complainant to ask, right? So our disposition letter says, you know, we concluded the investigation with a finding of sustained or not sustained or unfounded. If you have any questions, um, you know, you can contact my office. But we never specifically said, and oh yes, by the way, if you want to see the report, you can see it. Just, you know, the law says, if you ask for it, I have to give it to you. It doesn't say I have to tell you. Um, and so having the publicly you know, viewable, attendable, and then televised meetings, we were getting the reports out in a, um, I'm not going to say a sanitized way, but in kind of a concise way. And we were discussing the reports in a public forum that people could then go and see. Uh, so even if the people weren't going to go through the records request process and say, I want that report, they could go look at the recording and hear the conversation about the report. So um, we do you know, I'm very proud of our internal affairs function. We do very, very robust investigations. But prior to the Police Advisory Review Board, I, I bet in the 20 years before we started holding those meetings, I had two people ask me for those reports. So um, the quality of our investigations wasn't widely known. Now it is. The thing with the collective bargaining stuff, um, and there, there was a lot of apprehension. There was a lot of questions. They kind of threw their hands up in the air. I just had to point out to them, it, it's not a subject of bargaining. The record is public. How I choose to release it is entirely up to me. Um, so if I decide to redact it and to share it with this group, it's a public record, right? It's it's no different than if they, um, you know, the, when the media requests payroll records, it, it's a public record. You can't oppose that based on the CBA. We, we did have to be a little delicate um, I will tell you that it's, you know, I, nobody's told me I can't do it. If, if we release a case that's founded, the officer was responsible, it, it's released pretty much in its entirety. Only um, personal, pri uh, personal protected information, privacy protected information, identifying information like, you know, payroll numbers and stuff like that and witness information is redacted. If I share a case that was not sustained or unfounded, I redact everything. They can request a cleaner version outside of the public forum, but I'm not gonna throw my officers' names out there for complaints that they weren't held responsible for. Thank you. Can you um, give us, just just because one of the things we're struggling with is, you know, I thought it was interesting. You talked about one of the iterations, the the residents who were researching were sort of just like pulling willy nilly from all different kinds of communities and bodies and bigger towns. And we we have that struggle, right? Where, where there's like 40,000 people ish in Arlington mm -hmm. and there's not much out there for us to look at as like a, a model for where things have been done successfully right. in places like ours. So just to give us a little context, can you just give us a little summary of Pittsfield? Like how big is Pittsfield and how big is your department? So by census, uh, depending on who you ask and which census you look at, our census population is somewhere between 44 and 46,000 people. When I do planning, I use a figure of 70,000 people because we're the county seat. We have the hospital, we have the financial district. So we have to police everybody who comes to work and shop there. Uh, our authorized strength in our department is 97. Right now we're right around 91. Um, we handle about 70,000 calls for service a year. And do you know um, like how many complaints you get a year? I mean, um, like uh, that have to be investigated in this when I took over, we averaged about a dozen a year for the last four years. It's a, we average about four. Thank you. To your earlier point about the dearth of comparables out there. The, fir the first thing I would caution you about is don't look for comparables from other states. Right. Because because you're going to have to comply with the Massachusetts constitution. And so when you start pulling stuff in from 
I mean, if you look at anything that's not a commonwealth, you're automatically going to find yourself in some some um, gray areas. The other thing is, if you haven't asked Brian to do a training for you, we we had him. He hasn't done a training for us, but he spoke two meetings ago the the way that you have, and it was. I mean, we so, learned a lot. <laughs> so Brian has a very brief PowerPoint presentation where he kind of outlines the three main models that are out there for civilian oversight and kind of what's out there. When people, when people hear from somebody who's not a police officer that you can't really do the full Office of Professional Responsibility without paid staff, they back off of that a little bit, right? right. So you re you've really got an OPR, you've got an outside auditor, and then you've got this, you know, this more local homegrown thing. But if resources, require you to go with the more local homegrown thing, you lose some authority. There's, there's just no way around that. You're either going to pay professionals or you're going to concede some authority. And I just remembered one last question and then um, I'll move on to somebody else. Can I just, you probably said this, but who has the appointing, who appoints the members in Pittsfield? Is it all the mayor? Do you have to say? So, in the city of Pittsfield, so we're, we're civil service, police department, and fire department, and ironically, we're one of those departments where the mayor is our appointing authority and the appointing authority for all constitutional bodies. Um, there are some positions on some bodies that are by, like, so I, like on our traffic commission, I get a cop. She doesn't get, I get to pick that. Um, but the mayoral appointments are are strictly chosen by the mayor's office. I have a great working relationship with my current mayor. So I get a little bit of input on those. And I did get I did get to write the section of the ordinance about those dedicated members, the, the not at large members. That was my input. Great. Thank you. Anne. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I have a few questions about um, the committee and you mentioned that they have to get up to speed on policies, that they do the ride alongs, um, but about how much of a time commitment? Are, are they meeting with you monthly, more than that? Um, and how long are the terms of service for typically? Um, you're gonna, I, I will, have somebody from my staff send Susan the actual ordinance because I'm going to get the terms wrong, incorrect. I think they were originally staggered um, one, two, and three-year terms. And yeah. so they would roll. And the first set of three-year terms are now up. Um, so many of them are on extensions. The I So they meet, they're scheduled to meet monthly, but they have the authority or the ability to schedule special meetings in between if they choose to. Uh, and then they have some ad hoc work. So when we were doing the initial trainings, we did them during meetings. So like their first five monthly meetings, 90% of the meeting was trainings. There was very little, they, I didn't have cases at the time. So most of the time was theirs. We did training with our training unit. We had Mr. Core uh, come out for one and then um, virtually for one. Um, and then once they kind of got through that, we started scheduling the ride-alongs. So, um, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever done a ride-along. It can, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes. We generally restrict people on their first one to four hours or less. Some people don't even want to do the whole four. So those first couple of months was, were probably just an hour, except they, they probably had a lot of homework to try to get up with that. Then once we got through the initial policies and we could start the ride-alongs, it was the meeting. And then most of them were trying to get their ride-alongs in. So that would have been another two, three or four hours during that time. And then we got to the point where they were kind of, you know, meeting regularly, they were reviewing cases, and then they had ad hoc committee work. So I've had members appointed to meet with me on policy review on use of force. Um, our immigration policy, they, they worked with me on. So we would have one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, in between the meetings on those. Um, for those individual members, that was probably an additional hour or two a month. And then, you know, I, I might have three ad hoc committee members that I was working with each month. So. Great, thank you so much. Anybody else have, oh, Chief Flaherty. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Wynn, very much for being here tonight. Very no problem, informative. Chief. 
Most of my questions have been asked and answered. So the only remaining um, question I really have is, could you talk a little bit about the group's ability to take complaints? Sure. Um, and, and actually, this was some. This was probably one of the things within their granted authority that they struggled with the most. Um, so the ordinance does allow them to take complaints. It didn't create a mechanism for them to receive complaints. So essentially, we were left with our complaint intake process with our form, and they were granted the authority to somehow kind of receive them. Um, so we had to set up outside email for them and a mail drop box and stuff like that. But ultimately, um, it really came down to, you know, is it was there a responsibility to receive complaints or to assist with complaints? And this, you know, some some members were like, well, does that mean if somebody contacts me and they want to file a complaint, like I I can write the complaint for them? And eventually the members agreed that that wasn't the intent of the ordinance. It was receive complaints so they could send somebody a complaint, direct an advocate somewhere for a complaint, put somebody together with an advocate who was not necessarily a member, but the resident had to complete the complaint and then the member could receive it. Um, they can receive them via email, they can receive them by, you know, person. Um, and then they really struggled because the ordinance did not create an external mechanism like the post. When they get them, and they haven't actually gotten one this, through that channel, but the only avenue they have is to forward it to me. And then it goes into the regular complaint resolution process. Um, with the creation of post, that's gonna change, but. Thank you very much. Could you talk a, a little bit about that? It feels like a good segue into. As long um, as nobody else has any questions about the PARB, I'm happy to switch. Okay. Uh, sorry. I. I <laughs> I had sorry to ruin the transition, but <laughs> I I had um, a couple more questions about the PA Bree. So you mentioned that um, you know, well, we talked a little bit about collective bargaining, right? You've talked a little bit about you know looking at at um, sort of you know statutory statutory authority within the Commonwealth. Um, I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about like civil service and and how civil service may have factored into. Um, some of the constraints you guys may have felt setting up um, your your review board initially. Sorry, that went right down the wrong pipe. <clears throat> I'll try. <laughs> As a civil service police chief, I get frustrated by civil service all the time. But it's my life and it's all I know. If I had to speak for the members, I would say they were shocked and astounded by civil service like they just weren't prepared to deal with what that could what the impact could be we have a case and you may be familiar with it um we terminated an officer for misconduct they took it to arbitration the arbitrator overturned our termination we appealed it we took it to superior court and the judge basically said the arbitrator was wrong but they didn't make a error of law so i can't overturn this we took that case to the sjc and ultimately, we had to reinstate that officer. <clears throat> that was all during the time that the PARB was being formed. And they, they were shocked. They were like, okay, so here's a police department identified misconduct, did all the right things. And here's these outside entities that are going to essentially undo all the work that they did. I, I mentioned that and it wasn't strictly a civil service process because that particular officer picked the arbitrator, not the civil service commission. But the reason they picked the civil, the arbitrator, not the civil service commission was at that point, we had had like a 15 year run that we hadn't lost at civil service. Like I said, we're, we're, our investigative process is pretty good. It's very thorough. But that possibility always exists, right? So you've got this outside entity. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just talking about the stuff that PARB actually has, has some, oh, some oversight and input on. They, they have tons of questions about hiring, right? Where, we're restricted to hiring off a list of people that we don't have any information about. It's just, it's a bad business practice. And so um, one of the things we've, we've done several studies in the city about coming out of civil service. And one of the things the PARB has done is advocated and lobbied on behalf of the command for the administration to get us out. Um, 
again, we don't have any experience with the activities of PARB running up against civil service, but that's largely because our officers haven't used the civil service process since PARB was created. Does anybody else have any <clears throat> questions? I have, sorry, I have one one last one. You you made mention that you had a, a fair amount of turnover, right? People are coming up on the end of their terms, and perhaps not um, not coming back. I mean, I, obviously, you can't speak for those folks, but I wonder if you had any sort of sense of, um, you know, to my mind, right? It would be great to have a sort of you know length of tenure and continuity in that board, both for your sake and for the communities. I wonder. It yeah. Again, I don't want to speak for any of the members. Um, yep. They they've been meeting virtually, like as all, most of us have. Um, that's caused uh, some disconnect. And I will say that in the conversations I've had with them, either in the meetings or individually offline, there's there's a there's a enormous sense of frustration, uh, and the reason is their role by by ordinance is largely advisory. And so, as I said, you know, they can, they can read my findings, they can read the investigative determinations, they can disagree with them, but they can't make me change them. And um, in a couple cases, it's like, you know, well, you know, I completely disagree with you, Chief. I'm like, I understand that. But, you know, one, you're looking at one investigative, the final investigative report. You haven't seen the whole investigation. So you got to give me a little latitude here. Um, and the other, the other part of it is like during, so I told you how, I was originally sending those them policies for approval, final approval, and their own members came back and said, "We reread the ordinance. We don't get to do that. You know, we get input on the policies, but we don't get to approve them." And so, essentially, then their and it, it, again, it, their concern was we had a good relationship, but what if my successor didn't? You know, it would be largely a, um, an honorary kind of thing. So. Um, they, they invested a lot of time, talent, and energy in getting this board up and running. Um, and I think, you know, many of them were, just, they, they were frustrated at where they found themselves during the pandemic. Um, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, we didn't have a lot of cases. You know, we, we weren't doing a whole lot of activity all the time, so we didn't generate a lot of cases. So they were coming to meetings, and they were essentially hearing presentations and, and not doing a lot of work. Thanks. Thanks for the insight. I know. Sorry. I'll stop asking questions now. It's okay. <laughs> um, All right. So police reform in the post commission, uh, that, that is a, a monster. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that I can do justice to, to everything that is in front of us. So as Susan said uh, during the introduction, I am one of the inaugural appointees to the post commission. I am Governor Baker's police chief appointee. I'm one of three police officers uh, on the post commission. The other members of the post commission represent several different disciplines, including civil rights attorneys, um, faith community, forensic psychologist, uh, our chair is a retired judge, uh, social workers, uh, specifically social workers who have worked in prosecution. And um, we have this, this charge to kind of stand up what in December the governor signed as police reform. Um, some of it is very, very time specific. Some of it is is more longitudinal, it's, you know, kind of work in progress. Um, what I can tell you is the legislation got signed on the last day of December. Uh, we didn't actually get appointed until I think April. Um, we didn't actually meet for a couple of weeks after that. And then we had to dig into the work with some very, very difficult deadlines right in front of us. And we had to do that with no budget and no staff. So when we sat down to kind of lay our work out for us, um, we had, I'm going to say, so I'll, I'll say three, and then the, the third one will kind of subdivide. We had three time-sensitive critical tasks in front of us that, that we absolutely had to, to complete. The deadlines were, were not negotiable. The very first one was we had to develop and issue a set of guidelines. So guidelines, no statutory authority. Um, set of guidelines for 
de-escalation strategies, specifically when dealing with juveniles. That was number one, and we had to get that done, I think, in June. The second one right after that, and this one is pending right now, is we had to work jointly with the Municipal Police Training Committee to issue a set of regulations, statutorily valid regulations, on use of force prior to um, this set of regulations that's about to be disseminated. There was no statutory guidance on use of force. It was all case law and um, lesson plans. Um, we were one of a handful of states left in the in the nation that didn't have some regulations on use of force. And then the third time sensitive priority was to try to get some staff in place. Well, we were working on the first deadline. Um, Governor Baker did uh, request, I, I don't, I'm not on the finance side, so I haven't seen it all, but he did request a supplemental budget to help us get some staff in place and to start to locate some offices and get some infrastructure in place. Um, and then they did approve us to start the process of hiring three key positions. Those key positions being the executive director, the general counsel, and the director of information technology. Um, I'll go back and talk about the two processes first, and then I'll talk about those three key positions. So the um, so far, the way this work has been going is that the chair appoints a handful, usually three members of the commission, to work outside of regular commission meetings and work to kind of come up with the, the rough outline of the language and what we might be looking at, draft a, a template, then we meet with the entire commission in a public meeting. We vet that template, goes back to the working group, working group hashes it out again, might meet with some constituents or some stakeholders, and then we take it back for approval. On the use of force guidelines or on the guidelines for de-escalation on juveniles, that was pretty much the process we adhered to. There was a couple hiccups in that one. Um, I think the first major hiccup was nobody could find a agreed upon definition of de-escalation. So we kind of worked that one out. And then the second one was we couldn't agree on what was meant by the word juvenile, depending on what your background and experience was that was anywhere from 17 to 25. And so we kind of had to kind of had to negotiate that one. Ultimately, we came up with a nationally recognized definition of de-escalation and we hit on 18 and younger. Or juvenile, and we managed to hammer that out with the assistance of some uh, um, outside assistance from strategies for youth. And so we got that one out. It was actually, um, it, it wasn't as painful as I thought it was going to be. But again, it's guidelines. It, there, there's no requirement. It's a best practice or a recommended best practice. There's no requirement for police departments to adopt them right away. It'd be wise if they did. But um, Particularly in that one, we realized that some of the smaller departments, the Hilltown departments, rural departments, there's, they're not going to be able to make some of that stuff happen. They just don't have the personnel or the resources. The second one was the use of force regulations. And obviously, that was a heavier lift because that is going to be statutory. It's going to be by law. And we had to do that with the Municipal Police Training Committee. They had to be issued jointly. So the same process I outlined, but put in a series of negotiating meetings between our working group and the MPTC working group. And then everybody has to go back to their stakeholders and put all that in. That, that was a... Um, that was a heavy lift. That that was that was a lot of making the sausage, um, but they were subject to a public hearing. Uh, I want to say four weeks ago, Friday, three weeks ago, last Friday, and uh, the input, the written testimony from the public hearing was accepted by both working groups. It was renegotiated, and uh, we learned last Friday that that's being sent to the Secretary of State's office. So that uh, that one should be done. And now that brings us to the, the three key positions. So the three key positions, you got to have somebody who's a, a paid professional running, you know, running the office of the post commission besides the commissioners, because only Chair Hinkle is a, a full time commissioner, the rest of us is a collateral duty. Um, and then the general counsel, because we've been relying on a lot of outside counsel. So we really, you know, need some legalize on the work that we're doing because some of some of my fellow commissioners are attorneys, but most of us are not. 
And then the third key position is going to be our director of IT. And that that's probably the key position because a lot of what's included in the statute is this requirement for publicly viewable databases. There's 330 some odd police departments in the Commonwealth. They all have different records keeping systems. We got to figure out a way to get them into one centralized location, consolidate them, and then put them out in a way that can be viewed by the public. And we need to do that for both training and discipline. Um, and in most police departments, those are two separate software suites. So it's, it's twice as complicated. The good news is that Executive Director Zuniga started today. Uh, we got through the, the hiring process for him that was announced last week, and he is on the job. I checked before I logged into this Zoom. His LinkedIn has been updated. He is now the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Post Commission. It's official. Um, the General Counsel, uh, based on our last public Post Commission meeting, uh, we've We've authorized Chair Hinkle to proceed with that. They had already done a preliminary set of interviews and she was down to two candidates. So we expect to have the general counsel in place very shortly. I don't have a time frame on the IT director because uh, it needs to be somebody who's not just familiar across all systems, but somebody who's familiar with the Commonwealth systems. So that's, um, that's gonna be a very niche position. After those three key positions is when it gets very, very complicated, because essentially within the post commission, we have to build two offices. Um, one office is the certification office. That's the, the office that's going to kind of look at all the training records and figure out who's certified, who continues to be certified, who's not going to be certified. And then the other is, I I'm, don't have the statute in front of me, so I can't remember exactly. How, it's essentially the investigative branch. It's going to be that office within the post that's going to receive complaints and in some cases investigate complaints. Um, that's really going to depend on this, the sending agency's ability to do good investigations themselves because they're not going to redo them all. Uh, they'll review them and then and deliver a finding. But there are departments out there that don't have an internal affairs capacity, so they'll have to do those. I've received a ton of questions from the chiefs. Chief uh, Flaherty is aware. How do we get this information to the post? We don't know yet. <laughs> um, we set up a generic email address and said, you know, if, if you got stuff coming in on training, you got stuff coming in on complaints, just email them there. Somebody will disseminate it. But there's nobody there to receive it right now. Uh, we just we did what we didn't want is chiefs to get a random email 14 months from now saying everything for the last 14 months, send it now. Um, so we're just telling them to kind of keep up with it as it goes. Um, the big issue that is looming out there, and it, honestly, it hasn't come up in a post-commission meeting yet. I brought it up as a, you know, something we need to keep on the radar is this issue that is going to come to its head in the near future about the thousands of part-time trained officers, the reserve intermittent officers who are either working as reserve officers, their campus, their special state police officers. Um, for the most part, the responsibility for, for how they remain certified and what the training is relies with the MPTC, but the MPTC kind of has to send their plan to us and we kind of have to, you know, agree or send it back to be reworked. The MPTC, um, and Chief Flaherty may know, I didn't have the opportunity to attend the meeting. Uh, they came out with a recommendation that was not well received by a lot of the chiefs. And so they had to go back to the drawing board last week to try to determine um, you know, how they could tweak this. Essentially what they've come up with is a set number of training hours that needs to be documented and logged in combination with a set number of hours worked. And it's, it's not either or, it's both and. Um, and I don't have any part-time officers, so I didn't really have a clear understanding of this, but some of my fellow chiefs who did have part-time, who do have part-time officers is like, there's just no way somebody who has another job and it, you know, has been doing this a couple of days a month for the last 20 years is going to be able to meet both of these requirements. So it's very much up in the air right now. Um, I know that my colleagues at the MPTC are working really, really hard to try to figure out a path forward. Um, it's there's a time crunch on that because a third of the a third of the officers sorted by alphabet stand to lose their certification if they don't work it out. So we got to kind of get a plan in place. Uh, that's, that's the down and dirty on the post commission. 
Does anybody have any questions now? Thank you so much. This has been. Oh, sorry, Carlos, sorry. Another... Mr. Was... Mr. Newton has a question. He was just being polite. But, but Carlos is going to go first. So, <laughs> Carlos. I was, I was waiting for you, Newton, to come out first. <laughs> uh, Chief, just, just one quick question. Thank you so much for the, I mean, all the information that you're giving us today. It's fantastic. Um, in, in your mind, by right, uh, this investigative branch, by right, this office over there, uh, how do you think it might be able to be used by some of the smaller communities that might have a smaller board, you know, some kind of review board that they don't have staff, they don't have any of these things. So maybe they can just, maybe the, the local review boards can receive something and they say, you know, there's something here. We, you know, we look at the review, maybe we, there's something that we don't understand. Can we remit it to the state where maybe they can go around and, and look at this and have professionals say maybe they, you know, so they're like, maybe it's a like level that I, I just want to understand. To, so to I, your sense of view on that. I can't, I can't speak for the legislature um, in, in looking at the statute. Like, I think that's what they wanted, but I'm not, I'm not sure how they expected to accomplish it. So one of the interesting things about the investigative office uh, is that the staff they hire cannot be prior law enforcement. So I don't know how you get experience in doing detailed personnel related internal investigations if you're not a trained law in law enforcement internal affairs investigator so we don't know where they're going to draw the investigators from we can assume that they're going to come from the ranks of like insurance investigators but a lot of those in new england are prior law enforcement um or or some type of um legal and that you know the investigators assigned to like the ag's office who are not state troopers um but we don't, that pool's not that large. So we don't really know. I, I can tell you, and I'm, you know, it's going to come off as a little flip and facetious when the governor signed the bill and some of the stuff went into effect overnight, we were asking um, the executive office of public safety and security, where do we send these complaints? And they're like, send them to Yops. And we said, okay, what are you going to do with them? I said, we're going to send them back to the chief and the agency that the complaint was generated because they didn't have any other answer. And, um, and so for the last couple of months, that's kind of been the answer, right? Let send it to the professionals, have somebody up there to audit the quality of the work, and, and then we'll go back from there. Um, but that doesn't address the, the, so, you know, when I started doing some work in um, early 2020, and I was trying to figure out in, in internal affairs in Berkshire County, I did a survey of my fellow Berkshire County chiefs, I'm the president of the Berkshire chiefs, I did a survey. There was no other department in Berkshire County that had an internal affairs capability. They just didn't have it. Now, most of them are small rural departments, so I get it. But even the chiefs hadn't been to IA school. Uh, so we had, you know, we had to give them some resources and, and do some sharing. But under the new law, if a department doesn't have that capacity, and they should, um, they're not going to have any choice. They're going to have to send it to this, this post office. That didn't, not the U.S. post office, the office within the post. <laughs> um, the problem is, I don't know, like I know, I know what we're allowed to have as far as investigators. I don't know how we're going to get there. And I don't know how the, these handful of investigators, because the departments you're describing are the majority of the departments in the Commonwealth. I don't know how they're going to cover that many departments. Um, I think what may happen is they'll sub some of it back, but I'm, that mechanism has to be worked out. Sanjay? Thank you. No, that, that was going to be along, I was going to ask along the same line. So I think that's, um, no, and, and thank you again, Chief Wynn. This has been, you know, hearing it laid out, you know, it's, it's one thing to sort of read news reports and put together bits and pieces from talking to different people. Um, it's, it's great to hear it. Um, the, the one thing I will say relative to this line of questioning about what these investigations are going to look like, and again, I, I don't I don't know your community well, I mean, I'm slightly familiar with it, I've been through there, I don't know the culture, but I've had this conversation with other chiefs, and one of the things we've seen, not just with my local experience, but with civ civilian oversight across the board, or if you're using non-law enforcement investigators, is um, the findings in the discipline actually tend to be lighter 
and the discipline mm-hmm. tends to be lighter. So like my concern is disparity of, of findings, right? So let's say uh, I'm not going to use that department to the north of me. They're in the news too much. I'll pick a small town to the south of me. Let's say somebody files a complaint against a, an officer in Otis for some type of minor misconduct. It's not, it's not rudeness, but it, you know, it's not, they're not going to get fired for it. And on the same day, somebody files a complaint for the same misconduct against an officer in my department. Otis doesn't have an internal affairs function. They send it to the post. I sign it to my internal affairs team. Post does the investigation on the Otis officer. My team does the investigation. We slap my officer with a five-day suspension because that's the limit of what I can do as the chief of police. The post commission comes back and delivers us a finding of sustained with a recommendation for a two-day suspension or worse yet, a finding of not sustained. Now I have to send my investigation and my discipline to them. And now they've got two complaints received on the same day for two completely identical things with two disparate findings and disciplines because there's two processes. Um, I don't know how that's going to resolve itself. Doesn't this happen around the state already? I mean, I know it doesn't have to be it, adjudicated in a it, state It does, but they're never compared. That's, that's now true. they're all going to end up in the same database. Yep. So if you're the person who filed the complaint in Otis and you see what I did in Pittsfield, you're going to want to know why they didn't get the same. Yep. Right? So. Okay. And I'll be honest, as much as you see that as a, as a headache, I'm, I'm looking forward to that aspect, honestly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, because it can cut both ways and it, yeah. it can, but my fear as an experienced yep. police chief is it's going to reduce discipline. Yeah. I hear you. What, I hear you. Because somebody in your position. So why, why, why is your fear that it would reduce discipline and not increase? It's, it's going to lower, it's going to lower the curve. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yep. Any last questions for Chief Wen? This has been this has been really great. Like uh, I think uh, Sanjay or Carlos was saying to actually sort of like especially following we met with Brian Core a couple a month or two ago, sort of like get more on the ground. Like this is how it's how you've been able to develop something in Pittsfield that you know had many iterations, which is also, the history was really helpful and interesting too, I think, since we're right at this, we're the, as far as I know, the first body in Arlington thinking about this outside of the police department. But um, thank you. And uh, I know Susan has your contact information if we have any. As does Chief Flaherty. Chief Flaherty, who's, (laughs) yes. All Um, right, well, good luck. If I can be of assistance, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Have much. A good night. Thank you very much. Very interesting. You're quite welcome. Okay. That was so, so interesting. I want, I feel like, I really hope people are watching our ACME videos. Um, they uh, are. They are. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think that the next thing, does anybody want to talk about anything from the, from Chief Wynn's presentation before we move on to the rest of our agenda? Sanjay? Uh, I don't have an, I won't. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, okay, then I'm going to go back to the agenda, which is in front of me here. And I think the first thing is to approve minutes from prior meetings. Sanjay? Yes, I can share. Oh, can I share? Oh, do I have to do something? No, 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 no. I just have to find the right one. Uh, the eighth. Yes. OK, you guys should see. These are the um, September 8th minutes that I circulated. Sorry, I'm looking away from you to my other screen. Um, Oops, that won't work if I do that. Sorry. Okay, here they are. Uh, Let's just double check at least on the attendance. Um, I have everybody present except Karen and 
uh, carry, I think, the last time around. And I didn't get any corrections by email. Um, I don't know, I'll just scroll through here and people speak up if you had any. Um, thing before we, otherwise somebody will move to. Move to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Uh, well, Doug is here, not here. So I can take the roll call vote. Uh, we are voting on a motion to accept the September 8th minutes that have been submitted to all members. Car Carlos. Yes. Uh, Sanjay. Yes. Uh, Kathy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Bob. Yes. And Susan. Yes. So move. You you have to vote as well. Oh yes, <laughs> that's why it helps when Doug does it. Yeah. <laughs> um. Great. Uh. The next item on the agenda is updates from committees constituencies, which has become sort of our a standing thing on our agenda. I don't know who's met since our last meeting, which was pretty recently, but I will call on people. Carlos, do you have anything? No, I will be meeting, uh, attending the next meeting, the DTG, presenting the report, and then I'll bring back any, any feedbacks. They, uh, you know, I'll show them the, the questions that we, you know, we had last time. That's it. Uh, Karen. Oh, no, we meet this Wednesday. Okay. And Kathy. Nothing to report. Okay. And I think that's everybody with a committee. Um, oh, Susan, I always forget, Susan. <laughs> Um, nothing to report. Okay. Uh, okay. So. I, I was just going to offer for, for folks that are meeting with their committees coming up, if, you, if you'd like, you know, company presenting our report, I'd be more than, well, depending on whether I can make it or not, right? I might be um, more than happy to, you know, come with or, you know, if you would like, if you'd like company, basically. Great idea. I might take you on, on that. So, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody who wants, let me know. I I don't want to speak for Lauren and or for Laura and Susan, but they might be willing. If uh, yes. Also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Next is an outreach plan update. So I'm gonna send it over to Susan. Okay. Um. I'm sorry. I thought I'm just calling up. Okay, so um, lots of updates for you. First, I just want to offer a clarification that I did email out to the committee, but I just want to offer it in this meeting in case anybody is, you know, watching on uh, ACMI. After our last meeting, a member of the public was in touch with us to ask why we were adding police officers to the list of groups that we were having outreach to, given that Chief Flaherty is on the study committee. Um, and, you know, and if one person's wondering this, I'm sure other people are as well. So I just wanna share the response that I sent back <clears throat> um, and I'll just read it. So um, one of the things our study committee is benefiting from is the work that's come before us. We're not in a position to have to start from scratch and we can look what other groups have done and follow their model. Not surprisingly, you can't find any reports or recommendations regarding police reform without explicit mention of the need to center the voices of people from communities that have been historically overpoliced and underprotected, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and LGBTQI plus people. Those same reports urging the centering of these voices are equally explicit in recommending the inclusion of police in the reform process. Some examples include the final report of the president's task force on 21st century policing, um, a review of the president's task force report by the International Association of Chiefs of Police, um, and locally, most interestingly, the recent review of civilian police relations in Lexington included numerous interviews and listening sessions with police from all ranks, which resulted in new information about the racism experienced by some black officers in their interactions with Lexington's majority white population. Um, so I just wanted to state that 
you know, on the record in our meeting for any other members of the public who are wondering why we would um, proactively seek to involve police officers in this process. Um, okay, other updates. Um, Jill and I met um, last week, I think it was, and Jill has kindly offered the services of her office to set up a lot of the meetings that we are seeking to do. Uh, since Jill has been in town, she's done a ton of community engagement, a ton of community outreach, has a lot of contacts already. Um, and she also had some terrific suggestions for um, adding some people to our list. So what we, um, she is going to help us set up meetings uh, with BIPOC people who live or work in Arlington, people who live in public housing, uh, faith communities, veterans, immigrants and refugees, students and parents of students who've had interactions with the police. Um, a meeting conducted in, in Jill, I can't remember if um, it was Spanish or Japanese, whatever the language is in town that is the second most one spoken after English. Um, but at least one meeting conducted in another uh, language other than English. Um, and also town employees, as Jill pointed out to me, a lot of town employees live here. Um, they know a lot and they are often not asked their opinion. So um, am I missing anything, Jill? Okay. Um, Jill also is going to set up a Google form. So when invitations are sent out to folks, if they're unable to attend the meeting, they can fill out a Google form, which will have standard questions, and there'll be an option for filling out that form confidentially or anonymously. And that's a form that we can just publicize even beyond those invitations if we want um, to get uh, you know as much input into our process as we can. And I think those were the big updates on our community engagement and with the with the um, joyous takeaway that that Jill's office is going to help us with this. So thanks, Jill. Thank you, Jill. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Okay, the next item on the agenda is new business, which I just put there to as a hopeful catch all for anything that comes up. Um, one thing that I think Susan mentioned at our last meeting is that we were we were going to get on the agenda for a select board meeting. So we are on the agenda for next Monday's select board meeting, which is September 27th at 715. I don't think we know where in the agenda we will fall. So I have no idea what time it's gonna be. And Susan and I want to present the interim report and just an introduction to what our committee has been doing for the select board and anybody that watches select board meetings. Um, and then we thought it's pretty important to give at least a, we only have 10 minutes. So this is not like a huge presentation, but it's important to give uh, an introduction to the models of, of civilian oversight that we've studied and learned about. And so since Carlos did that, pre that presentation many moons ago, um, I emailed him today to see if he might be available to do part, that part of the presentation. And I think he's good to go. So we will coordinate uh, later in the week. Um, I'd love to encourage anybody who is able to come to, it's a Zoom meeting, um, anybody from our committee who is able to watch the meeting to do so. I think it'll be helpful to see what, if any questions, the select board members have for us. We know that like Len Diggins has been to a number of our meetings, so he is pretty well informed about what we're doing, but um, we don't really know what other people are thinking about. So if you can do that, Susan. I would just note that um, just point of interest for folks, two members of the select board shared on their social media platforms, um, the interview that Sanjay did on ACMI and that was uh, select board member, Eric Helmuth and select board member, Diane Mahan. They both shared the, uh, the video interview. 
So okay. there's interest. Um, so yeah, that's exciting. It's sort of our beyond people choosing to come to our meetings, our first foray into the rest of larger Arlington. So um, I'm looking forward to that, sort of. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Susan, I think you had an update about the interim report. I do. Um, so we have our interim report, we've approved it. And then um, we were going to add a section in about how complaints regarding police interactions get reported. And um, after you know drafting it and talking with Chief Flaherty and also talking about this with um, Jill and talking about this with Kathy, I realized that people have different definitions of the word investigate and investigation and, and how they're done. And um, while there's one official way to file complaints in Arlington, which is through the police department, sort of this informal ad hoc process has cropped up where people do go to the AHRC and they do go to Jill's office. And it seemed like we should maybe take a little bit more time um, to more accurately represent this process, um, how it's working, how it's not working. And toward that end, we thought it might be terrific actually to ask Jill to present on what she's experienced um, in assisting residents with navigating this process, just to learn a little bit more about how it's working. So if anyone has any questions about that, I probably won't be able to answer them, but that's the update on. So, so the idea is rather than put it, adding that as a, an into this report, we'll have a further discussion and then perhaps issue some sort of document at that point. Correct. Is that a? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're muted, Laura. Laura. Sorry. Um, Jill has seen the interim report as it currently stands and approved it for ADA reason, all the, what we need to know. So we can publish what we have. I forgot, I meant to check in with you, Jill, about who we should talk to about getting it translated and in what languages to get it translated. So I will follow up with you about that. Um, but to the point of having Jill talk to us at one of our future meetings, I wanted to check in with Sanjay about the how much information you have or don't have yet in order to come up with a schedule for future meetings. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think, I think almost, I think everybody that's here tonight <laughs> responded to the doodle poll. Um, but we had a number of people not respond. Um, I, I do, we can pick um, dates and we will have quorum if everybody who indicated their attendance shows up. Um, oh, Michael has his hand up. Uh, or maybe I, said a, I said, no, I had a question about just the report. When would that be released to yeah. the public? So, yeah, I, will, I, I had held off on putting it onto the committee webpage because I thought we were going to be voting on an amendment to it today. And I was like, I don't want to put two versions of it out there and deal with that. Now that we're not doing an amendment, I will have it on or I will ask the town staff to put it on the website tomorrow. Um, and then if any of you need it quicker than that, just email me and I will give it to you. Um, but I'll email the committee once it's on our website with right. the town. Um, but okay. yeah, I had I had held off because I thought we were amending it and I didn't want to mess people up. So yeah, no. Uh, no, thanks. It, it becomes a resource that I can point people to. Great yep, thing. absolutely. Yep, no problem. That's a good question. Um, in terms of dates, um, I'm going to apologize to Carlos because your dates were the opposite of almost everybody else on the committee. I'm so sorry, um, but uh, or everybody that responded anyway. Um, so I think we could do October for October. The I think we need two for October is what we had said, right? One for public input and one for a meeting for us. Yeah. Um, and so the two dates in October, uh, or sorry, there are three dates that are equal in October. Wednesday, October 6th, um, Wednesday, October 13th, or Wednesday, October 27th. Those all had 
um, equal um, yes votes. So I think it would be good for us to hear, and is Jill available all of those dates? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, yes. Okay. Because uh, I think it would be great for us to have our us meeting where we hear from Jill before the public comment um, meeting. So, and just in the interest of not having meetings two weeks in a row, I would say the public comment meeting October 27th if that sounds good. And then it also gives us more time to get people out to show up. Um, and then I don't have an opinion about the 6th versus the 13th for our meeting. Anybody? How long does Jill need to prepare? <laughs> right, because that's- well, Jill's opinion is- Yeah, honestly, the 13th would be better. Like the next, it's been, it's a time right now. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, then we'll do the 13th at, and we will hear from Jill at that meeting and the 27th for a uh, public comment meeting. Then we can talk on the 13th also about how we wanna structure that meeting on the 27th. Sounds terrific. I see Bob has a question. Oh, Bob. Uh, I couldn't get at the doodle to uh, fill it out. For some reason, it was not responding to uh, my trying to put something in. But uh, for what it's worth, and it doesn't make any difference, but uh, Wednesdays are definitely out for me all, all through the month. So oh, sure. uh, with that, but don't, don't go on with that. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll follow up with you for making sure we get November straight. Okay. Um, is that okay? Does that, does that work? Bob? That's fine. I'm sorry that I couldn't. I couldn't access it for some okay. reason. Yeah, for the future, just let me know if, if you have problems. And um, you can always, anybody can just send me dates directly if if the poll doesn't work. Okay, all right, thank you. For future reference, yep, no problem. Sorry about that. Do no we problem. have anything else that anybody needs to bring up? Because otherwise we can have a motion to adjourn. Someone want to move to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Um, I will do a roll call vote. Uh, Michael, you're voting on adjournment. You're muted. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sanjay. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Bob. Yes. Susan. Yes. Carlos. Yes. And I vote yes. So the meeting is adjourned and I will put the 13th and the 27th on the town calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night, Good night everybody. Good meeting. Thank you both.